What you're about to hear is an allegedly true story of an attack by a wild wolf which occurred in northern Quebec in Canada in 2001. It was emailed into the channel by an individual I'm going to refer to as OS. This is the encounter in their own words. I am responding to your question concerning wolves from YouTube. I got your email from Jay. Sorry it took so long to respond. I live in Quebec and lost my arm after the second vax. In 2001, September 11 ironically, I was walking along a trail in northern Quebec and was surprised by a wolf. She dragged me 1,000 metres. I know this because the section I was surveying had markers every 250 metres. I was knocked down at 1500 and finally got loose at 2500. No provocation, just pow. When I reported this to the RCMP in hospital, I was told by the constable, doctor and someone I don't recall who she was, that they won't report this because wolves don't attack people. We're going to deal with this story in two parts. Firstly, we're going to look at the attack from a behavioural and an historical perspective. Secondly, we're going to do some experiments to find out just whether a wolf could be capable of dragging a person for an entire kilometre, as described by OS. We can learn from wolves, not only about the world around us, but the world within. They occupy a unique place in the land and the mind, in these dark hours at the dawn of the Anthropocene. I was initially pretty sceptical of this story. It seems really unlikely that a wolf could drag a person for an entire kilometre. But as soon as I started doing background research, I began to turn up some unexpected facts which gained a little bit of weight to the story. It happens that a year after OS's story is set, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game released a statement about the conservation of wolves in the area. A cross-check of the dates revealed that there was nothing to suggest wolves in northern Quebec could be a nuisance. That is right up until the end of the report, uh, case number 75 out of 80. The report is titled 50 kilometers north of Tazia Jack, Quebec, 1999. The case describes how professional wildlife photographer Heiko Wittenborn was photographing caribou when he inadvertently witnessed a failed hunt by a pack of local wolves. Taking advantage of the opportunity, Wittenborn set his tripod up on the wolves' line of travel in an attempt to get a better shot. Two of the pack obliged in this, continuing on their path until they became aware of him at a distance of about 50 metres. Undeterred, they closed the gap to 20 metres, where the lead wolf adopted a slightly crouched posture and edged to within 3 metres of the photographer, only a tripod now separating them. At this point, Heiko attempted a dog-like growl, startling the wolf, which circled once before the pack continued on their way. A note by the author correlates the pack's behaviour with naivety. Wolves who have never encountered a human before will often respond with a mixture of curiosity and fear. Wittenborn expresses his concern that the wolf who approached him closest was not in the least bit deterred and was perhaps prey testing him. He suspects that if he had not tried to imitate the growl of a dog, he might not have left that day unscathed. This report reveals that bold wolves were, at the very least, present in northern Quebec at the time OS's story is said to have taken place. We're also able to ascertain the general conditions that the wolf which attacked OS was subject to. Prey availability and the hunting of wolves in Quebec was summarised in a report by the Fish and Game Department just two years prior to his story in 1999. From this, we know that wolves had been trapped and hunted for over a decade in the province, the numbers fluctuating year to year but staying mainly steadily except in the south where more intensive hunting had caused the populations to decline. Now, separate research has also shown that wolves living in areas subject to harvesting and trapping 
may also stay with their family units for a much longer period of time. This could mean that the animal that attacked OS had fully reached maturity and was perhaps a couple of seasons old and in good physical form when it encountered him for the first time. It may still have never encountered a human at this point in its life. This does fall in line with our story, since a wolf which attacks because it's starving wouldn't have the physical strength necessary for a prolonged attack, as we've seen in other cases from North America in the past. From weather records of September 11, 2001, we know the day in northern Quebec was partially clouded with intermittent light rain and a fresh breeze. The temperature reached into the low teens Celsius, and visibility was excellent, so it's unlikely the wolf was surprised into attacking, and instead selected OS deliberately as a potential meal. The animal itself would have been either a grey wolf or eastern wolf subspecies, both of which are behaviourally identical for purposes of our investigation. There is also a chance that this could have been an escaped or an abandoned wolf-dog hybrid, which may account for some of its unusual behaviour. Rabies is also out of the question. The duration of the attack does not correlate with that at all. It's possible the animal may have been previously habituated to human presence, as we've discussed here on the channel. There are, and were at the time, a number of open landfills unprotected in northern Quebec, but all we know for certain is that the wolf rushed and knocked OS to the ground, and showed no sign of being deterred. This is pretty unusual. OS describes that there was no warning that the wolf was about to attack. Wolves will generally observe and then rush their prey to test its response, as opposed to going all in and trying to take it down immediately. But for whatever reason, it seems this animal chose a very different strategy. Now we're going to get to the technical part. The victim verified that the wolf dragged them for a thousand meters because the trail that they were on had survey markers placed every 500 meters. Even if we assume that the survey line was on a curve and that they intersected this on a straight line, this is still a really long distance for a wolf to drag anything. We've seen it happen in the past with Candace Burner in 2010, who was dragged from the place she was killed on the side of the road, uh, down a gully into some scrub, but this was nothing compared to what OS states happened to him. The average Canadian weighs about 86 kilograms. Now, we know that a wolf can drag that kind of mass, but we're not sure that it can manage it for such a length as was given in the story. Since I don't have a wolf at hand to find this out with, we're going to have to try and solve this problem through experiments. Now, this plastic spring scale here measures up to 32 kilograms of force. And if I pull it with my bare hands, come on, all of my arm strength generates about 18 kilograms force, that's 176 newtons. So let's see how much force is required to drag me. Okay, so we've driven out to the back roads now where we've got pretty similar conditions to what OS described in his email. We've got intermittent rain most of the day and a good mixture of three different surfaces. We've got the paved road we're parked up on, and a dirt track further up, which will give us less friction, and then some grass as well for if he wasn't actually on the trail. So we're going to wait until there's a break in the rain, and then I'm going to sacrifice my nice expensive jacket for science. Go when you're ready then. Now, if you ignore my screaming, you'll see that the spring meter maxes out almost instantly as we overcome static friction and then only dips when my cameraman stops pulling and I slow down. That's well over 35 kilograms of force, or 340 newtons just to move me. That's gone off the scale. Really? Yeah. Oh my god. What's more, we've deliberately chosen slippery gravel to give us the least possible resistance. When we tried other surfaces, yes, more screaming. Clearly the force needed to move me is far more than I anticipated, and I don't have anything stronger to measure it with. 
However, all is not lost. That's because the friction between the gravel road and, let's say, cotton clothing doesn't change regardless of how much force is being applied or how heavy the person wearing their clothing is. This is called the kinetic coefficient of friction, and by calculating it, we can work out exactly how much force would be needed to pull our 86 kilogram Canadian. I've loaded my backpack to 15.8 kilograms, and it's mostly made from polyester and cotton, which should be a good analogue for most casual clothing. Dragging it over the dirt trail, we can see that 8 kilograms of force is needed to keep it in motion, but when we move it to uncut grass, that force increases to 12 kilograms. Since we don't know the exact surface OS was dragged along, I'm going to suggest it was in the middle range of these two, which works out nicely to 10 kilograms of force, or 98 newtons. To find the coefficient of friction, we just divide the force on the spring meter by the normal force on the bag. That's its mass multiplied by gravity. So 98 newtons divided by 15.8 kilograms multiplied by 9.8. That gives us a coefficient of 0.63. With this value, we can plug it into the equation for friction. So, the force of friction is equal to 0.63, the kinetic coefficient we've discovered, multiplied by 86, the average Canadian's mass, multiplied by 9.8, the force of gravity acting on him. Because the force required to move him without accelerating is equal to friction, the average Canadian therefore takes 530 newtons of force to drag along unmaintained ground. That's equivalent to 51 kilograms of force. No wonder our spring gauge went off the scale. Next we need to know how much energy this takes. We know that OS was dragged for a thousand meters, and for the purposes of simplicity, we're going to assume that this was on level ground. To find out how much energy this takes, we just need to use the equation for work, which in this case is simply work equals force multiplied by distance. So 530 multiplied by 1000 means that the wolf was going to have to use 530 kilojoules of energy to move the victim for this distance. Now, let's be realistic and say the wolf dragged OS at a speed of around 5 km an hour, completing the 1 km stretch in 12 minutes. In this case, it's having to expend 530 kilojoules of energy every 12 minutes, or 2650 kilojoules of energy per hour, and that is the important figure. An active, healthy adult wolf needs about 25 megajoules of energy per day, way more than enough for this exercise. However, that's for an entire day, and it works out at just over 1000 kilojoules per hour. Now, that's about four times their basal metabolic rate. To drag its victim for a kilometer, our wolf would have been needing to expend about two and a half times that value again. That gives us about 10 times their basal metabolic rate. Now, unfortunately, I couldn't find any hard figures for wolf maximum calorie burning. However, there is a 1998 study that shows African painted hunting dogs can achieve up to 25 times their BMR. That's more than twice what we're asking of our wolf. So that seems to answer this part of the story. A typical wolf should be able to drag an average Canadian for about a kilometre if they really wanted to, and at that point they would probably be exhausted enough to give up and allow the victim to escape. Now this is obviously vastly simplified, in real life the wolf would have been pulling the victim at a slight angle upwards, so the figure might have been more around the 600 newtons mark. Variables such as wet ground, the victim's actual weight, and the wolf's physical condition are going to remain unknown to us as well. There is still one more mystery left to us though. 
why the wolf decided to drag him in the first place. The most plausible scenario I can imagine is that a naive or bold wolf grabbed hold of a backpack OS was wearing which contained food, and in attempting the theft, he ended up dragging the victim with it, perhaps assisted a little by gravity. After more than 10 minutes of the victim seemingly not wanting to let go, the wolf simply gave up, too exhausted to continue. The remainder of our story also provides a few interesting points. OS states that they were taken to hospital, but did not reveal the extent of their wounds. It's most likely that the hospitalisation was to test for rabies, but the most interesting aspect of the story, perhaps, is that a police officer who was present dismissed his claim of an attack by a wolf. This does fit in with similar reports of the time, at this point in history, there were no recorded fatalities of attacks by wild wolves in North America, and it wasn't until four years after the encounter we've discussed took place that Kenton Carnegie was killed. His death is thought to be the first documented case of an attack by wolves which resulted in a fatality, and that attack also occurred in a remote region of Canada. So, do I think the story is true? Well, that's not really the focus here, and I would leave that kind of assessment to people who have a good amount of experience in wolf behaviour. What we have learned here, though, is that dismissing a claim because it doesn't fall in line with known data, or simply doesn't sound plausible, can be incredibly damaging. In this case, if the story is true, the reaction by authorities could have contributed to a misconception that's caused loss of life for both wolves and humans alike in the years since. The misconception that wolves will not, under any circumstances, attack a human. What are your thoughts though? Maybe you've had a strange wolf encounter of your own that you would like to be featured on the channel. If you have, then leave a comment or email me direct at projectdarkwolf@outlook.com. If you'd like to support the project, then go ahead and leave a like and subscribe to the channel for more videos. And if you feel really generous, then have a look at my Etsy store, because you can find merchandise there that directly supports wolf and large carnivore conservation and research. Until next time though, I hope that you can share what you've learned today and help others as well embrace the project's aims to understand, coexist and evolve as a species.